Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Glad you're still awake after lunch. It's an enormous pleasure and honor to be invited to take part in this conference, and a real delight to be with you for a discussion with one of the great minds of our age in Marilyn Robinson. So thank you for your attendance. Thank you to those who put this program together. And I'm very grateful to be here. About a week ago, I was writing a comment on a theological manuscript which had been sent to me. The manuscript represented the reflections and recollections of a Methodist minister who had for many years been involved in chaplaincy to people living with HIV in London. It was a difficult, even an alarming manuscript to read. Not only did it describe in relentless detail some of the sufferings, mental and physical, which this particular minister had witnessed, it turned towards the churches and posed to them a most unwelcome and tough challenge. The problem, said this chaplain, was that so much work and ministry undertaken with people living with HIV had been predicated on the assumption that it was about good people doing good to other people. Goodness, said this minister, is the problem. We do things in order to be good, or perhaps to seem to be good. We do things knowing who we are to those we define as different from us. And the result, very often, with the best and most generous will in the world, is that people's sense of isolation, powerlessness, and rejection is intensified rather than healed. Some years ago, I had the privilege of reviewing Marilyn Robinson's novel, Lila, on its first appearance. And one of the points I touched on in that review, and a point which came alive for me again last week, was that it seemed to me to be a novel about the insufficiency of goodness. And it's that theme I want to reflect on a little this afternoon. The good are those who don't always see what they're implicated in. We like to define ourselves as good, very often because we like to make sure where our boundaries are. We like to be confident that who we are and what we are is generated by good motivation, by divine agency, by good education and upbringing, by generosity of temperament. And that can blind us to the ways in which we are shaped by what we don't know. As a self, I'm always already implicated in what I don't know and what I don't see. And simply to focus on goodness in this rather narrow and self-defining way can be a problem rather than a blessing. One of the things which good fiction can do for us is to help us retrieve the lost connections between the good and reality. And I read Lila as a book which was very much focused on exactly that question. How do the good recover their connection with truth and reality. How are the good saved? Never mind the evil. It's strange, isn't it, that quite often we think of the novel as typically the product of an individualist moment in our civilization. Novels start happening because people become interested in the unique life stories of characters. 
in a way which they're not quite in the pre-modern period. And yet it seems it's the novel which again and again can display to us the ways in which we are more than individual, the ways in which we're connected before we realize it with one another, so that we can never be good on our own definition, because we're never anything on our own definition. We are implicated. And the whole sequence of fictions about Gilead deals in any number of ways with that sense of buried connections. Gilead is a town that has forgotten a great deal of its history. It's forgotten its radical and risk-taking edge, and so it's become good. It's become good in a way which is toxic to those who don't happen to belong. It becomes good in a way which can, as we have seen in the reflection we heard this morning in that wonderful lecture in the person of Jack, it's become for those who are on the outside of it something which further complicates, further entangles destructive behavior. So the challenge of this sequence of narratives is as much as anything to see where the connections are that make us who and what we are without our knowing, recognizing, or wanting. All fictional narrators know more than their characters do. They can display in their characters what those characters ignore or don't know. And thus, all writers of fiction are in a position to display what the great physicist David Bohm called the implicate order of things. How we are implicated in a world we don't control or organize simply from our own individual perspective. It's why also narrative seems constantly to call for more and more perspectives, an ever richer multiplicity of narrational perspective and standpoint. It's why one fiction focused on one character ends up generating another. And part of the joy of reading the Gilead sequence is precisely to watch how the questions and unfinished business of one perspective push the author and the reader to look for the other. There are, as you will all remember, scenes in that sequence which are beheld from those different perspectives, as if no one telling of the story can capture it all. And if no one telling of the story can capture it all, still less can any one perspective within the story tell it all. And I'm inclined here to open and close a bracket and simply add, maybe that's why there are four Gospels. Close brackets. So, so far from being an individualistic, modernist enterprise, the novel is in a remarkably good position to show us how much more there is to us than a narrowly individual perspective. In a good position to show us our implicatedness, the implicate order in which we're already embedded. But this is where, of course, the whole agenda becomes strikingly theological, in a way that, again, the end of Lila brings out with unforgettable clarity. If Lila, then also all those who made her to be who she is. If Lila is redeemed, then are others redeemed in her, with her, through her? That's the question with which the novel leaves us, a question to which Lila has her own unambiguous answer. To put it still more theologically, if God wants Lila's company, mustn't we say that God wants the company of all those who have made Lila, Lila? And there's the theological heart of this perspective. We have to move 
from a focus on goodness, it seems, to a focus on solidarity. To what it means for us to be bound to one another and shaped by one another to the extent that none of us can be brought back into full healing relation with God without one another. How very easily the Christian imagination slithers over this, not to mention the contemporary social imagination. As if to pick up the, the textbook caricature of what Thomas Aquinas doesn't actually say in the Summa Theologiae, as if one of the joys of heaven would be rejoicing over the number of people who weren't there. As if one of the aspects of our redeemed existence would be the final declaration of those about whom we no longer have to worry. Lila, at the end of the novel, is left very properly, very theologically worried about those whose lives have been implicated with hers, those without whom she would not be. It's not a million miles away from the extraordinary revolution achieved by Karl Barth, the greatest theologian of the 20th century, in his rethinking of the doctrine of election. God elects, God from all eternity chooses Jesus of Nazareth, and in so doing, chooses the entire world that makes Jesus Jesus, and that Jesus makes. So far from God's eternal election being a celestial grading exercise, it becomes the radical affirmation that the world is connected and that no being within the world, no element within the world lives except from the life of another. This is something different from simply a glib universalism. God loves everybody, so everybody's all right. Because as the narrative of Lila shows, what it might mean for any part of that great complex of creation to live into and to realize God's election, to discover reconciliation for themselves, is a painful, uncertain, lifelong exercise, not just the affirmation of a guaranteed happy ending. But I believe that what is happening in these fictions is a kind of translation of that basic theological insight of implication. We ought not to be too surprised our fundamental Christian texts tell us that the nature of the Christian community is implication. The loss and pain of one is the loss and pain of all. The joy of one is the joy of all. And as St. Paul repeatedly insists, especially in his Corinthian letters, that means that none of us can imagine our own healing and reconciliation purely as atoms. Paul is no more of a glib universalist than anyone else. But he does leave us with that challenge. How should we imagine a healing that we can only achieve together? To begin to imagine it, we have to begin to purge our own imaginations of some of the fantasies of a goodness that can be ours in the absence of our neighbor to move from goodness towards solidarity. And that's why I think, <clears throat> though Marilyn may be a little surprised to hear me say it, that these novels are exercises in Christology. Exercises in thinking through what saving solidarity might mean. Because that is the agenda of Christology. What is saving solidarity? Not how did an individual called Jesus 
make life a bit easier for individuals like us. But how did the connecting, life-giving wisdom of God so live and die and rise in this world as to reconnect us with one another at a level we can barely begin to reach to? So there are two sides to an ethic and a theology of implication and solidarity. The first element is to remind us that we need to beware of conceiving the good as segregated and self-conscious. Back to my Methodist chaplain friend. To be good is so often to be good at the expense of those we are being good to, however much we might try to conceal that. And this is perhaps the place to quote one of my favorite dicta from C.S. Lewis, familiar to all of you. She lived for others. You could tell the others by their hunted look. <laughs> we need to go beyond the good as the segregated because, of course, when Jesus, in the fourth gospel, says that he is about to sanctify himself, he means he is about to accept the reproach and the pain of the rejected. His self-consecration to the Father, the ultimate embodiment of his perfect, flawless goodness, is his identification with the sinful world on the cross. Can we begin to think of the goodness or the holiness of the church in that kind of light? To think that the church's holiness comes alive when it is most in the proximity of those most in need, most under reproach, most rejected. And the trajectory of the spiritual discoveries that are going on in the Gilead novels seems to me to be a trajectory along those lines. We heard this morning, and I'm tempted to say, just think back to this morning's lecture and ignore what I'm saying, because there was so much and so beautifully expressed there. What we were reminded of was the way in which John Ames himself overcomes a particular kind of frozen, or damaged or deficient goodness in the moments when he discovers an unexpected solidarity with Jack. He allows himself to recognize that they belong together, not apart. That, as I say, is the first element of an ethic, a spirituality, if you like, of implication and solidarity. A goodness which wants to forget the perspective of the stranger. A goodness that always wants to retell its own story so as to justify where it now is and ignore the loose ends. A goodness which seeks to deny what has actually formed the present moment is a goodness which will work finally, not for our healing, but for our death. But the other dimension of this ethic or spirituality, or whatever you want to call it, of solidarity, is the invitation to recognize that we arrive at healing by way of solidarity. To take another of the figures so prominently commemorated here at Wheaton, Charles Williams, I'm reminded of a poem, a little known poem by Charles Williams, which deals with that troubling story of the man who turns up at the wedding feast without a wedding garment. And Williams imagines this as a man who's turned up simply in his own clothes, who hasn't had the grace to borrow clothes from someone else. Because we all come to the wedding banquet, says Williams, dressed in each other's virtue 
each other's love, each other's vision. And the problem of the man without the wedding garment is that he has come with nothing but what is his. And so it's not entirely surprising that he doesn't make it through the door. Or, as it was put much more vividly by a Russian Orthodox friend of mine, I won't try to do the accent, we all go to heaven in each other's pockets. That's the other side of it. We challenge our understanding of goodness, the segregated and self-conscious understanding of goodness. We accept our implication and our solidarity with a past and a present we don't always particularly like. At the same time, we recognize that our healing arises from the same solidarity, particularly as for the Christian, that is the solidarity into the center of which the Son of God has stepped once and for all. In thinking about the Gilead novels as a challenge to the way we privilege goodness over solidarity, we're certainly not, as I understand it, trying to suggest that in some way this is a judgment light or a judgment free spiritual world. As I said earlier, this is something rather different from the assumption that God is good and so everybody goes to heaven and that's all we need to know. It's not so much a turning away from the prospect of judgment and the pain of loss as an attempt to see exactly how it is that loss happens on the one hand and healing happens on the other. No determinism about it, but just the patient tracing of how we are healed by relation, not by isolation. What Lila sees at the end of the novel that bears her name is the way in which a whole series of profoundly flawed, guilty, damaged persons have very mysteriously helped to create in her a responsiveness to grace. She has discovered a responsiveness to grace because of all these damaged lives that have surrounded and entered into her own. And if something of them lives in her, there's something at work in them that breaks the hold of destructiveness and challenges the triumph of death. And that something is what the grace of God does and works with. That's why Lila cannot imagine being where she is without those who've made her who she is. That, I suppose, is why, in terms that would be familiar to a Karl Barth, we're thinking of the process of healing and redemption as a process in which judgment itself is judged. The judge who is judged in our place, says Karl Barth. That's to say the nature of our healing is such that it challenges and relativizes all that we securely think about judgment because our deep guilty secret is that we want to be judge and only one is and it's not us. To say that is by no means to accept a relativism an indifference about life and death and good and evil, but to recognize the judgment under which we stand together because we can't simply extract ourselves by some subtle spiritual surgery from what we're implicated in, in this shadowed, deprived, painful human world that we share. And once again, we come back to the central narrative of Jesus Christ as the one who confronts John the Baptist 
and John the Baptist's shock and protest by saying that he has to be where sinners are. And from beginning to end of the gospel story, that is where he is. Grace, not goodness, is the key to our healing. And to, to say that is to say that we're healed in relation, not only to God, but to one another. That without that dimension, we're back with toxic goodness again. The goodness that forgets and excludes. Lila's problem in the novel is that the instinctive warmth, human friendliness, human constructed solidarity in Gilead cannot allow itself to be wounded and broken open in such a way that the stranger is welcome. Whether that stranger is the racial other or simply the socially marginal and damaged person like Lila herself. But to learn to be wounded in our goodness, to learn to have that dimension of our self-image and self-presentation cracked open, it's the beginning of where grace can act in us. So a fiction which works as a presentation and an imagining of grace is going to be a fiction that helps those cracks to appear. The old chestnut about the cracks where the lights get in. It'll be a fiction that at its most acute wounds our self-satisfaction by reminding us of what we don't know and what we're trying to escape. But any kind of good fiction will at least go some way towards wounding or piercing to the extent that it tells us there are things you will not know and cannot know. And you have to go on telling and you have to go on listening. The fiction continues to unfold the listening continues to unfold. I'm invited into one perspective after another. There's always that dramatic element to the working of a good fiction. So the points I made earlier about the importance of diverse perspective and about the solidarities that we forget, they actually belong together. They're all about the way in which a good storyteller tells us not just what we don't know, but what the characters don't know. And will tell us in all kinds of ways without necessarily having to spell it out. I've suggested in these reflections on Marilyn's novels that there is a very deep Christological theme at work here. Something to do with the fact that our basic Christian narrative, no fiction this, is the narrative of divine solidarity with the human race, not just with the good. But that, of course, is part of where the community of Christ should be speaking, living, and acting into a world that is deeply obsessed with being good. One of the paradoxes of our own age is that whereas most of the traditional markers of Christian virtue seem to have disappeared, there is an intense preoccupation with being good and being right. We look constantly for new ways of reassuring ourselves that we are good and right. We enshrine in law, for all sorts of good reasons, ways of assuring ourselves of our rightness and limiting our risk. At worst, we create 
we have created and are still creating societies and a global society in which our ethical life as a human race is increasingly a zero-sum game. Because part of the attraction of my rightness is your wrongness. For a society and a culture that's so often thought of as relativist, we are extraordinarily absolutist about a whole range of things. And that absolutism is an emotional rather than an intellectual matter. An absolutism which says, I must never be wounded. I must never be left not knowing. I must never be left in a moment's uncertainty about where I stand. I reach in these days, and I say I because, of course, we're part of this. When it's not them over there who are doing all these bad things, it's you and me, unfortunately. I reach for those images which help me not be wounded and which tell me that I do know, rather than accepting that my life, my well-being, is constructed by grace precisely as the cracks appear and the models of goodness are dissolved. I should perhaps say again, opening and closing a bracket, that one of the things which definitively tells you the impossibility of being good is being Archbishop of Canterbury, but that's, uh, <coughs> that's perhaps another story <laughs> which you really don't want to know about. <laughs> but in a culture where we have this paradox of the urge to be good and to be right. Christian witness, direct and indirect, theological, literary, imaginative, whatever, Christian witness has to be one of those factors which brings into our common life an awareness of the perspective we don't have and can't have, which brings into our Christian life a sense of the necessity of the crack and the wound and which, therefore, is deeply, systematically suspicious of all those strategies that we devise as societies to alienate and distance the stranger. My Methodist friend, writing about his experience of ministry with people living with HIV, wrote with quivering passion about the way in which certain rhetorics about marginality, about sinfulness, about being compromised and being unclean, were thoughtlessly deployed by those who thought they were being good. God loves everybody, even someone like you, is not necessarily the best pastoral approach. <laughs> and his writing made me see, as few things I've read recently have, just how deep that goes in us. We think we are being, to use the fashionable word, inclusive, when we say, even you, rather than beginning with, even me, or simply, us. God doesn't love even you. God certainly loves even me. But above all, God loves us as we are together. And apart from that togetherness, our healing doesn't happen. I don't need, I think, to elaborate the ways in which, on both sides of the Atlantic, political rhetorics of exclusion and otherness dominate. We are a profoundly anxious civilization at the moment for a variety of reasons, good and bad, mostly bad. A civilization which is so unsure of itself that it scrapes around to summarize the values that it holds in order not to have to listen to the stranger. We forget a history that is formed by immeasurably plural and often deeply compromised strands. We forget the history of diversity, interaction, migration, conflict, 
tyranny, genocide, slavery, empire. We forget what's made us who we are. And if we forget all that, then our sinful ancestors and our sinful fellow human beings have even less chance than they would otherwise have of reconciliation and homecoming. You remember that haunting phrase in Hebrews about how our ancestors without us are not made perfect. And that seems to me to be yet another expression in scripture of solidarity as the key to our understanding. So in sum, what I'm proposing is that we read these fictions and many other fictions we could talk about, but these in particular, as a systematic question to our goodness. Not as a kind of romantic flirtation with a beyond good and evil language, which is fashionable in some quarters, not even as an obsessive, tragic interest in evil as the next step to good or sin as the next step to sanctity. Marilyn Robinson is not Graham Greene. Simply as a reminder that goodness is not enough. Goodness, self-defined, self-contained, is something which will be poisonous if we're not careful. Without the wound, the openness, the crack that connects us to reality, to one another, and to God, healing doesn't happen. The good can so easily think that healing is natural. Revelation tells us that healing is indeed the restoration of a broken nature, but that precisely because our nature is broken, that healing is more than natural. Did God choose Israel because Israel was larger, wealthier, more successful, and more devout than the other nations? No, says Hebrew scripture. Does God choose us because we are cleverer and more pious than others? No, says St. Paul in 1 Corinthians. We are implicated in a world of deep shadow and extensive compromise. But as St. Anthony of Egypt is said to have remarked, our life and our death are with our neighbor. Understand our implicatedness in a sinful world, and we begin to understand why we are saved, not by goodness, but by a new level of connection, which we call the body of Christ. We don't know how the grace of life in that body will actually reconstruct and make whole lives that we see around us as broken and shadowed. But we can and must hope for the simple reason that we are who we are because of them and they because of us. At the heart of it all is the great connection made by the incarnation. And that incarnation, as Bart says, is God's act of affirming the connectedness of what God has made. Fiction, if it's doing its work, will always, I've suggested, take us into that deep level of connectedness. For a fiction that works with and is inspired by Christian themes, we're taken into the deepest connectedness of all, in the light and in the hope of which we live and pray for one another. Thank you. <laughs>
Lord Williams has been gracious enough to take time to answer a few questions. If you have a question, please come to the microphone. I ask that you keep your questions brief and uh, we will end in just 10 minutes. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. That was wonderful. Um, I work in a, at a human rights law firm that focuses on corporate accountability. And something that you had talked about was goodness versus solidarity. And something that struck me as you were speaking, one of the subjects, one of the aspects of the world that we're focusing on right now is child labor within the cocoa industry. And kids that are trafficked, put in unsafe conditions, et cetera. And what our dream would be, of course, is to eradicate child labor within that industry and in all industries and give it zero market access to the US. Unfortunately, if you do that, there are huge repercussions that come along with that. And something that kept ping-ponging in my mind is that idea of goodness and solidarity. And a lot of the perspectives that I'll hear from people as we talk about our different strategies for this is you'll hear one side that will be all for just decimating the entire market and eradicating child labor effectively. But the other side will be talking about what are the repercussions of what that will do to the children themselves, to the industry, but also to the people that work within those corporations. And I guess it made me wonder what does it look like to be in a gray area between goodness and solidarity of not only realizing that you are connected with your neighbor and what happens to them, but furthermore, you're connected to future generations and what happens to them. And sometimes it feels like it can be a negotiation between the two as you try to create a new and whole future for everyone included. Thank you, that's an extraordinarily perceptive set of reflections, I think. I'm really grateful, because I think that brings into focus, doesn't it, the way in which sometimes we are impatient for the good because we can't bear to live with the irresolution and the sense that we're not, you know, we're not there, we haven't arrived. Um, in Umberto Eco's novel, The Name of the Rose, um, one of the characters says to another, why, you know, why are you so unhappy about the idea of purity? What is it about purity that makes you so uneasy? And the other man says, haste. Yeah, we ought to be there. Now, you use the very important word negotiation. And I think that's key. Because negotiation means there's labor and there's listening to be done here. We have clearly in our view, as, as you said, the goal we want to get to. It, we should not live in a world where there is child labor. You know, end of. Meanwhile, we do, and day by day, we are implicated in that. And the implication means that we have so constructed the world that simply to end child labor doesn't solve the need of the children involved. So the negotiation, the careful attention to the particularities of the question, the sense that there are small gains worth making even if they're small, and the sense above all that what we've got to do is push our imagination further forward, not just our legislation. I think all of that comes in, doesn't it, to the kind of work you're, you're talking about. It's, it's appallingly difficult. It comes, it comes home to me, particularly in our current discussions in our university about our investment policy. And yeah, that's another area where we would all like to be pure. Um, and if anybody here is pure in respect to investment policy, I'd really like to hear from them afterwards. <laughs> Thank you, that's such an important point. Wish I could say more, but that's, you know, to start. I'm John Wilkins, and uh, I, listening to you, I've been reflecting on Genesis, and the world was formless and void. So in the few places where rhyme is used in, the, in, in Hebrew, it's vohu v'tuhu, which is wonderful. Uh, that is answered subsequently by not saying, let us make, ma and apart from gender, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. You see the correspondence, the image and likeness? And 
immediately goes to male and female, made he them. Now, it was not an assignment that one gender is going to be God and the other is going to be, it, it wasn't that. The way I am reading that, and I was reminded as I listened to you, it is not the way you look or you look or any of us look individually, but it's in relationship. Am I on the right track or? Thank you. Thank Absolutely you. right. Yes, that's, that's a wonderful connection to make, I think. Um, and again, I, I'd look at some of Barth's theology where he talks about precisely the complementarity of human identities, including gender identities, as part of that picture where the image is not you, me, or any isolated feature of the human, but human beings as being in communion. So I think... You got it from Bart, yes. Of course. So did I. <laughs> Solidarity. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Williams. My name is Sean. Um, thank you for what you said. I was really, really helped, especially with respect to Jesus's, uh, God's election of Jesus as being the affirmation of everything that contributes to Jesus and Jesus's relation to the interconnected whole. So I guess my question is, as I'm starting to think through those themes, um, I, in my heart, I know my own tendency, probably with the tendency of everyone, is to tend towards idolatry in that the goodness of creation and the healing of creation and the interconnected whole of creation becomes kind of the ultimate telos of my affections. How, what are some strategies or some ways of thinking that you use um, so that you see the interconnected telos of creation, the interconnected healing of creation as actually something that leads up into the adoration of God into that, that stirs our affections and our delight mm. in the Lord rather mm. than making the flourishing of humans and yeah. the interconnection of, huma of the human race mm. as kind of the ultimate goal of the Christian life. That's a very good point. Thank you. Um, I suppose it comes back, doesn't it, ultimately to what, what we think creation actually is. And of course, creation is not God making something which God then puts at arm's length. <laughs> Again, as we were reminded this morning, I'm sorry to keep quoting the, the better lecture of the day, um, but I think what we were reminded of was God's sustenance of creation is the life that God continues to give moment by moment, so that where creation flourishes and is most fully itself, there is the creative, sustaining, loving wisdom of God. So to look at the world when it is healed and fulfilled is to look at the glory of God as it is reflected, spelled out in the intricacy, the interweaving of the world's beauty. It's the whole of the wisdom tradition in Hebrew scripture, isn't it? Which reminds us that when we see the world looking as it should, behaving as it should, we see wisdom. We see what God's wisdom rejoices in. We see the joy of God. And I think to, to look at the world, and the hu including the human world, in that light is one way of getting around the idea that somehow to look hard at the world is to stop looking at God, or to look hard at God is to stop looking at the world. God, as the world's creator, is a God who has promised to be the God continuously active in the world and supremely active in the redemption of the world. So I think it's, it's about creation itself, isn't it, somehow? Yeah. Thank you. I'm afraid we will need to cut the questions there, so uh, oh. apologies to those. Sorry. Who get to <laughs>